couple of things. Uh, the church board, uh, because your moderator double booked himself for this Thursday, uh, that's going to be put off for a week. That would be me. So our board meeting is now going to be on the 16th. Uh, Christmas carol sing on December the 18th, which is two weeks from Saturday, from yesterday. Um, it's going to be at 6.30. Contact Chess if you want to uh, bring a special musical number, a solo on an instrument, or you want to sing a song. When I see the sunrise in the morning, when I feel the wind blow across my face, when I hear the sound of children playing. I know it's a hope of God's amazing grace. And I believe there's a place called heaven. I believe
Scripture for today is taken from Luke chapter 1, Matthew chapter 3, and Mark chapter 1. In the sixth month of Mary's, Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching. His message was, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The prophet Isaiah was speaking about John when he said, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road 
for him. May the Lord bless the reading of his word this morning. Well, this is the Advent season, which means that it is a time of anticipation and preparation for Christmas. And of course, as we look at the candles over here, we have the candle of hope. That was the first one we had last week. This candle here, that's hope. Then today is the candle of preparation. And then next week will be the candle of joy. And the one after that will be the candle of love. And in the middle, this white one is called the Christ candle. And that's Sunday, December 26th, which is called Boxing Day. But it's our Christmas Sunday, actually. And that will be the theme of light on that Sunday. Well, preparing is the name of what uh, we're doing today is we're talking about preparing. I was standing in line at the Toronto Dominion Bank the other day, and as I was standing, I was looking at some of the displays, and all of a sudden I saw these words, and they said, preparing to save or saving to prepare. Think about that. Preparing to save or saving to prepare. And I thought, well, that's an interesting thing. I could use this kind of a concept for the sermon because I've been working on this sermon as a preparation for Christmas. And I thought, well, that's an interesting saying. So what we've got today is prepare yourself to meet Jesus, prepare yourself to live, and prepare yourself for action. That's what we're going to spend the next few minutes, just having God's Spirit dig into our hearts for the future. So, prepare to meet Jesus. How, you say, he's not here? Well, you know what? When the prophets and John the Baptist talked about preparing and said, prepare the way for the Lord's coming, clear the road for him, Jesus wasn't there then either. But he was on his way, so that's what it is. He's on his way for us, so we need to prepare. Listen to how the letter of Hebrews describes the coming of Jesus. Right in that first chapter we read, Long ago God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets, and now in these final days he has spoken to us through his Son. The sun radiates God's own glory and expresses the very character of God. That's who Jesus is. He gives us the glory of God come onto this earth in the flesh and expresses the very character and nature of God. So this Christmas, prepare yourself to meet Jesus, God's Son. Last Sunday, we had a baptism here. Hayden Asp was baptized. And as Hayden shared his story of how he met Jesus, these are some of the things he said. He said, I started to show an interest in topics about life and the meaning of life and the purpose of life. And you know, I started then to check things out on the internet. And all of a sudden, on my smartphone, what appeared were all kinds of topics about Jesus, about God, about Christianity. And at first, I ignored them. Then after a while, I just said, i got to get rid of these, and I couldn't get rid of them. They kept coming up. These topics on my smartphone about Jesus, about the church, about faith. And all of a sudden, he says, well, you know what? I'm just going to keep on digging a little bit deeper. And so Jesus was on his way, you see, to meet Hayden. And he met Hayden. And what did Hayden do? Well, he cooperated in these moments of getting acquainted with Jesus. He followed up those leads, those links that were coming to his smartphone. And so then he started to spend time with people who had already met Jesus, like Pastor Justin, some of you. He started to spend time with you. He started to come on Wednesday evening to our growth group, to our Bible study and prayer time. 
And he contributed. He was there. And he was growing in his understanding of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for him in his life. And then he started reading the Bible, God's Word. And then something miraculous happened to Hayden. Jesus was right there, and Hayden felt Jesus knocking on the door of his life. And Hayden basically said, I opened the door of my life to Jesus, and I said, Come on in to my life, Lord Jesus. I'd like to know you much better than I know you so far. I want to live, and I want to have a fulfilling life. And so what did Hayden then do? He prepared himself, and he and Jesus met. And that meeting resulted in a declaration, I believe in you, Jesus, and what you've done for me. And the baptism was what followed. So now that Hayden is baptized, I would suggest you can meet Jesus the same way if you haven't yet. And if you have met Jesus, here's the next miracle that can happen. And that is prepare yourself to live to really live once you have met Jesus. We should listen to what Jesus himself says about all of this, don't you think? Here's what he says in chapter 10 of the Gospel of John. Jesus is speaking to people, and they want to know the truth, these people do. But they're skeptical, not sure. And so Jesus tells them a real life story about a shepherd and his sheep. The shepherd, you see, has these valuable sheep. And you and I are like those sheep. And Jesus wants to be our shepherd once we meet him. And so he says to us, you are my priority. All of you sheep out there and up here, you are my priority. I am the shepherd and you are the sheep. But, he says, you know what? Watch out. Because there are so many others who say, ah, they're shepherds too. But all they want to do is they want to take advantage of you. They're phonies. Watch out for those phonies. They will make over-the-top promises which they cannot keep. They will entice you and seduce you. They will confuse your mind. They will rob you of your commitment. And they will use you for their own selfish ends. These are the ones that are like thieves and steal your life away from you after making promises of good things which they can't keep. They're going to ruin your life, and they will leave you empty. And in the end, they're going to be exposed as nothing else except that they are scammers. Scammers. They're scamming your life. They're taking away what you could have with the real shepherd, and they want you for their own purposes. The truth, Jesus says, is that I am the real and the only good shepherd, the authentic one for you, for you who are my sheep. Now, you're saying, why are you the only real shepherd, Jesus? And his answer to us is this, because I gave my life for you to make you free. The others, they're not giving their life for you. They want you to give your life to them. But I start by not asking you for anything, just to say, I'm giving my life for you. That's my gift to you. I want to give my life to you to make you free. I want to make you free from guilt, from sin, from alienation from God, I want to connect you with the Father in heaven again. I want you to be free from shame. I want you to be able to breathe and have life and have it abundantly and have it in a full way. And so he even says that 10th verse of John 10, I have come that you may have life and have it in the most fulfilling and abundant way. So, are you preparing to meet Jesus this Christmas time? Are you preparing to have real life this Christmas time, starting now? Let me tell you how this plays out. 
Immediately after Jesus says all this in John chapter 10, you go to the next chapter, which is 11. And you know, there Jesus is asked to come to the house of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Those three, those two sisters and that brother, they are close friends of Jesus, you see. But there's a sad thing that's happened. Because Jesus' good friend Lazarus has died. And so he's called there like a doctor is called to a house when somebody is very sick or has died even. And when Jesus arrives, the very first thing that the two sisters, Martha and Mary, greet him with is, what do you think? A complaint. A complaint! Jesus, if you would have been here, my brother, our brother, would not have died. You're late. You missed it. He's dead right now. And then they add a little bit of a softer tone, and they say, but I know that God will even give you now whatever you ask. A little ray of hope that maybe Jesus has an answer for the death of Lazarus. And then Jesus turns to the sisters, and this is what he says. Your brother will rise again. He will come alive again. And the sisters are a little skeptical too. And what they say is, yeah, I know he's going to rise again. You know, way in the future on the day of resurrection. But what good does that do us right now? He's dead. And then Jesus answers with this. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live. You met Jesus, now he wants you to live because he's the resurrection and the life. If you believe in him, you will live, even though you will eventually die. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Ooh, eternal life now, right? Do you believe this? That's what Jesus is asking us. Do you believe that I am able to raise you out of the deadness of your life and give you real life? When you meet me, Jesus says, you got to know that I will change everything in your life and you will really come alive. And so Jesus then says, okay, Lazarus is in the tomb. Take away the stone." And we read that they rolled the stone to the side. And then before Jesus does anything else, he looks up to heaven and says, Father, I thank you for hearing me. You always hear it, but I am saying this out loud for the sake of all of these people standing here so that they will believe that you sent me. I know that you hear me, Father, but these people, they don't really know yet that you and I are one. They need to hear me talking to you, Father in heaven, so that they will believe that you have sent me because when I tell Lazarus to come out and get up, and he does, they will know that God is at work here. And so that's what he does. With a loud voice, Jesus calls Lazarus, come out. Lazarus appears. He's coming out. And then Jesus says, take off his grave clothes, that linen stuff, you know, and let him go. Let him live. Then and now, Jesus turns to us and says, and this comes straight out of the Bible, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? When we meet Jesus and we believe in him and he does things in our life for us to really live, did I not tell you that if you believe in me, you will see the glory of God in your life? You will. Jesus does not want a mediocre life for us. He does not. The key truth is that we are like dead people. 
spiritually dead. Lazarus was physically dead. But the symbolism is for us who are also spiritually dead. And until we discover and answer the call of Jesus to come out of our dead life and rise up into the abundant life that Jesus offers, we're going to be living mediocre lives without the risen Lord giving us real life. You may have met him, but now you need to come alive. Prepare yourself to really live, because that's what Jesus would really want for us. Isn't it time that you met Jesus and prepared yourself to come truly alive? When that happens, you're ready for the next big miracle. The next big miracle is prepare yourself for action, for action. What a glorious encouragement Peter gives us when he says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Read that sometimes. 1 Peter 1, verse 13, so prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. You prepared yourself to meet Jesus this Christmas right? You are preparing yourself, are you not? You are preparing yourself to live with Jesus in your life. Are you not preparing yourself for that? Well, now that you've done that, you are ready for action in your life in the name of Jesus. There's nothing fancy about this action. I'm not giving you a pep talk here. I'm just giving you biblical information. So, this is biblical information in an action in an example in an illustration happening right here so listen to this action that's happened in our church with you it's simply about responding to the nudging of God's spirit in our life let me show you what that looks like for us we know and have a relationship with three principles of three schools Parkdale, Centennial, and Norwood schools. And we are aware because of our relationships and knowing these principals and other staff members in those schools, we're aware of the need for food among those students in those schools and their families. So we need, as we've talked to those principals, we need a total of at least 60 food hampers that need to be given to some of those students and their pa uh, parents and families. So the deacons got together, and the treasurer, Ken Farr, got together, and Hope Mission with Jared Jorstad, who is the managing person at Hope Mission here in Wetaskiwin, we all got together, and we decided that we could have a concerted action effort between the schools and our church to supply those 60 food hampers for Christmas for those needy students and their families. We announced it in the church. We had opportunity for people to contribute. You see, you're taking action. This is action that comes when you meet Jesus, when you find real life in Jesus. He's going to cause you to do some real good action. This is action in process. So we announced the need for the opportunity for financial support. And last week, Ken Farr announced to us that $3,315 have come together, and that is for the food hampers. We can make food hampers of about $55, almost $60 per food hamper for those 60-some students and their families. Now get this, that wasn't all. It wasn't just Ken Farr and Deacons and Jared and Hope Mission. Oh, no, no, no. It went much further than that. You see, we have in our congregation some very good master purchasers, masters who know how to buy stuff real good. And this was, of course, Black Friday and 
also Cyber Monday. This was the right time. They didn't even wait to know how much money we had. They just went out in faith and did some action. And you know who I'm talking about, don't you? Yeah, Norma and Gordon Canfield. Yeah, they went out and they bought all of that food and they packaged it all up already themselves. It's sitting at their place. And now it just needs to be picked up. We're ready to go. We got in touch with the schools. Guess when those food hampers are going to be delivered? This week. Now, do you see what I'm talking about here? That here are people in our congregation. We've met Jesus. Jesus has caused us to come alive with real life and with caring, compassion, and we see that Jesus has called us to action, and that's what we've done. We are prepared to act in the name of Jesus. Now, that is what makes us, or what makes us different from just being humanitarians, because lots of people care and do good things, but what makes us different, those who have the life of Christ in us, what makes us different is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what it says. All of this preparation for the life of action depends on that verse, and it says this, for we are God's masterpiece. Remember those sheep I talked about before? You're not only sheep, you're God's masterful sheep. You are masterpieces of God's creation. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things God has planned for us long ago. That's where the root of our action is. You are masterpieces of God's creation. He has created you for good works, for good action that he has prepared for us. And he's saying, I've prepared it for you. Now go ahead and do it. And you know what? You've responded and you've done it. You have become people of action. That is what Christmas is about. Prepare yourself to be people of action. Of action. So, when you meet and receive Jesus, yes, He is the Savior of the world, no doubt, and He wants to meet you, He wants to give you life, and He wants to make you people of action. It's Christmas season, it's the season of preparation. It is the time to prepare ourselves to meet Him, to live life to the fullest and to act on his behalf. Because he is the savior of the world, but he is also the king of kings. If you are affiliated with Calvary Baptist Church, we encourage you to continue your regular support. Or if you are a visitor and would like to support this ministry, please send your contributions to the address posted on the screen. Or you can send your support with an e-transfer to the email address also posted on the screen. Thank you for joining us as we trust you have met with the resurrected Jesus along with us today. May the love of Jesus be your joy this week.